Welcome to the Highbury Squad. You can follow us on Twitter at Highbury Squad. In fact, it's the same on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and eventually iTunes. Join me, Sophie, aka at Soccer Diva, Amanda, aka at Guna Girl 1969, and our very special guest, Super Kev, Super Kevin Campbell. It's just like being down the pub with your mates. Welcome to another epic episode of the Highbury Squad. To say that the Guna Nation is buzzing might be a little bit of an understatement. It started with Liverpool's win over Tottenham this weekend. But it's kind of been building up over a few weeks, hasn't it, Guna Nation? And I'm so stoked today that the entire gang is with us. And we have a very special guest as well. We'll introduce him in a little bit. But first, without further ado, allow me to introduce the Highbury Squad family. Princess Guna, how are you feeling this evening? Oh, I'm feeling very thirdy. Very third. Just very third. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Extremely (laughs) third. And our podcast bro, Super Kev, Super Kevin Campbell. Does it feel a little lovely up there in the north? It is beautiful. It's beautiful. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me introduce our guest because he's a good sport coming on tonight's show. And let me say we've had a few good sports coming on the show in the last two or three weeks. We've had a Tottenham. We've had Ben Hayward from the Evening Standard. Uh, we've had uh, Dale O'Donnell from Stretty News after we beat, we, we, we tied a great game against Spurs. We beat Man United. And here we are this evening, a, a very good performance from a Newcastle team. And joining us tonight is a lad from Stoke Newington. And let me say, this is the top shelf geezer, ladies and gentlemen. He had a phenomenal career at Wimbledon. And listen, millennials, if you don't know about Wimbledon, you go Google it and look that crap up. Because let me tell you something, this was the team of all teams. When you talk about March Madness, the basketball right now, and Cinderella and upsets, Wimbledon was that team. He then went on to Newcastle United and had a phenomenal career, 164 appearances. You can now see him every single day, every single weekend on our screens in the United States on Fox Soccer. Let me introduce to you one of the nicest men in football, ladies and gentlemen, Warren Barton. Woo! Hi, Warren. Thank you very much. That's a bit of an intro, that one. Yeah, how do I follow that? No, I'm not I feeling mean, dirty. Listen, at the just have Kate try and do that. And no one at Fox yeah, is going to give you that kind of intro, Warren. Just have a word with them, mate. No, I know, I know. I don't get the, the loving that you're giving me now. <laughs> I, feel, I feel very like 17th, 18th place at the moment, not third anyway. <laughs> <for Newcastle. laughs> Well, let me tell let me, before we get to tonight's game, I did want to say one thing and I wanted to get your take on this because I think any other manager, Newcastle United is in that trouble zone. It's in the uh, it's in the Huddersfield zone this season. Warren, before we get to kind of talking about what happened this evening, Rafa Benitez has done an incredible job with very little at Newcastle, not only this season, but over the last couple of seasons. Is he not the main reason why you guys are staying up? And to be honest with you, for a fair bit tonight against Arsenal, did a brilliant job defensively, kind of putting all your men behind the ball. Is Rafa not the guy that you have to keep hold on, uh, you know, hold on to as opposed to trying to find other players in this off season? Isn't he the MVP for you? Yeah, I think he's been phenomenal since he's been there. I mean, you know, he's not been blessed with the quality of players that I was lucky enough to play with, the likes of Giannou and Shearer, uh, Espria, Peter Beersley, these type of players, Gary Speed, um, who was, you know, very, very good players. He's had to, if you like, wheel and deal. We have spent money. I mean, I think we, we sometimes get a little bit carried away that he's not had the money that he would like with Ashley and the problems that they've had there. But he has had money and he's found some very good players as well that have gone in there, which is... Uh, Seems a good professional, played a lot of games in the the Premier League. So he seems a player that he's gone out and got. But he has spent money. um, And obviously, the quality that you need, you've got to spend hundreds of millions to uh, try and compete. Arsenal are going to have that problem to get, you know, into the Champions League and compete where they want it to be, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. You've got to spend that type of money. Uh, But Rafa Benitez has been excellent. Um, He loves coaching. And I think it sends him. And Kevin will, will, will know and, you know, dealt with someone like George Graham that, he wants to be on the training ground. He wants to organise his players. He's not a coach that just brings players in like Harry Redknapp and turns them around and just uses them for a year or so. He likes to work with his players 
Um, and, and I think he's getting the best out of this bunch. And with all due respect to the players, there's not too many of them that you think we're getting any top six teams at the moment. Maybe one or two of the centre half. Um, Algaron, really, if he starts to regress with the kid they got from Atlanta. But he's done great. Uh, he's, you know, working under extreme pressure with the fans and the expectations from the owners. But I think we're safe this season. But we need to be better than that. You know, as I said, I look mm-hmm. at where Newcastle was when I was there and, you know, Kevin, I tell you, we, we was challenging, um, and, and, and trying to push in the Champions League and trying to win trophies. Um, and it's a long way from that, but he's doing a great job. You're right. If it wasn't for him, I think we would really struggle. All right. So, Warren, I started on this question, but Kev, I'm going to take you a little bit further back now, too. And um, I want you to um, let everyone know where it started for you and Warren. And then even Amanda has a Warren story, which, you know, it just never surprises you in football. <laughs> well, I, I think our first our first games was in you football, Warren, wasn't it? Against each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was you football. And I always, I don't know, I always seem to get along with you, even though you were in the opposition. I always got on with you. <laughs> That's I'm a great. Nice fella, Kev. It's a nice fella. Well, 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 there's didn't, another reason. You're the opposition, so you've got to be the enemy. Do you know what I mean? But I always got on with you, and we've been friends ever since, haven't we? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know playing against each other. You can be enemies, like you said. And we used to kick me. I used to kick you. But we say sorry afterwards. <laughs> and I, I think that's what's gone out of the game a little bit. Is that togetherness? That we are professionals. It seems to be. You know, I'm too good to talk to you. I can't have a conversation. You know, many many years ago, and then not only playing when we was against Arsenal together for years. Uh, obviously, when you was at Everton, for you know all the clubs you played against, I knew it was going to be a tough game because you was a top player. But you're a good professional. You know, you wasn't someone that was going to try and hurt you. It was going to be physical, good game. And, and obviously, I think we all missed it, Kev, didn't we? We all, we all missed the fact of them good times and good memories because so many good people, you know, people like Ian Wright that you play with. And I was lucky enough to be with, as I said, people like Alan Shearer and, and Rob Lee. That was good times, good games. And, you know, to come through like I did with you know, Tim Sherwood I played against when I was like 13, 14 years of age. And David James and Dean and David Holdsworth uh, you know, yeah. didn't play too long in the Premier League. But, Good people, and um, it's always nice to, to reminisce, because when I think about that, I get a smile on my face, so that, that's always nice. Uh, Warren, just one more. Could you give us a story from the crazy gang? Because a lot of people don't yes. even recognise about the crazy gang. What yeah, I like. mean, it was... I just thank God there were no phones and things like that at that time. <laughs> because, um, that's what I, mean. <laughs> I feel for Pickford at the moment, because that was happening every, every time he said what we were doing. So the, yeah. <laughs> I am worried about that. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the initiation test, you know, if you ever got, well, it wasn't too many, to be honest with you, but if we ever got picked for the international teams, whether it was Vinny for, uh, for Wales or myself with England or Big John Fashion, uh, the owner, I'm not talking about another player, I'm talking about the owner, would go to your car and, and slash all the tyres. And I know they wasn't like now Ferraris and Lamborghinis, but they were decent cars at the time, but he would be the one that would slash all your tyres and, and that was his <laughs> way of... Sam. of <laughs> <laughs> of keeping keeping your feet down, and then if you if you did an interview in a paper, say you know we were lucky enough to beat Liverpool or Arsenal or Man United at the time, which we would do because you know when I was there for the five years, we'd end up always in the top seven, eight, yeah, nine good, in the good, league. Good side, uh, tough side, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know they would burn your clothes and cut all your, your, your uniform up and stuff like that, or they put other uh, human <laughs> things in your toiletry bag and things like that. And if you if you got upset with that, like we had a kid called Kenny Cunningham who went on and played for I, uh, Ireland, uh, uh, Republic of Ireland for many, many times, and Millwall, good professional, particularly him and his wife on game day, he'd love wearing a new tie every game. He'd come there. He wasn't the best dresser, Kev, but he wasn't nowhere near like you. But he liked wearing a new tie. That was his, that was his thing. So every, every game, what did the lads do? Cut his tie. So we'd go oh, in the bar. He'd walk, he'd walk in. She'd be having a face like thunder, having a go at all of us. So we all looked at each other. Make sure we do it next week. And we just kept going. Yeah. And that went on for yeah. about 18 months. So Torture it was part of... Yeah, exactly. And her, because she used to go mad for it. But, oh, um, so, we, you know, it was all them type of initiation tests to be with people. I remember, you know, as I said, got into the England squad and there was a big media day that I was... Well, not a big media day, but there was people there. They thought it'd be hilarious to strip me and throw me in the puddle. So I had to walk past 
the whole of the press people there with their cameras with a, a police cone over my bits and pieces. So, uh, and it was, Kevin was one of the big police cones as well, son. It, was one of the, it had to be, didn't it, Warren? <laughs> it weren't one of them little markers, I tell you, to get no. on the A3. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, so, Warren, we're going to go back to your youth, right back to your youth. So, what the listeners oh, well, don't know is that you and I knew each other when we was about, I don't know, what, 10 or 12 years of age? That yeah, sort of yeah. time, I assume, when you was in Walthamstow and I lived next to your family and you used to come and play football with us and <laughs> so many funny stories that I will not put on here. I mean, the New Year's Eve party was funny enough. That's all I'm going to say. But going back to then, um, I remember the team that you supported. Are you going to tell us all who you supported? Yeah, I'm very, very proud of it. I was, uh, my dad was uh, a big fan. My brother, my older brother, Johnny, as well, was a uh, big yeah. Arsenal fan. As you said earlier, I was born in Stoke Newington, um, you know, only about a mile away from the ground. And at the time, people like Liam Brady was my hero, Frank Staper and David O'Leary going to the marble stairs. And it was quite surreal, really, when I ended up playing at Highbury the first time to walk up the marble stairs turn right into the changing rooms. I was going to say locker rooms, and I've been here too long, but turn into the changing rooms and go to the heated floors. And it was nothing like that at Wimbledon. I tell you, it would be concrete floors, and we used to... You know, you put, used to uh, wet them. <laughs> we used, used to pee on the floor to make sure the showers were cold. But yeah, to go into oh, that bit... Yeah. <laughs> to be, be an, hey, Kevin, hopefully you never had a cup of tea at uh, Wimbledon. Not, you shouldn't have got in the triple bowl. I, I would never touch it. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm you know, playing playing there and you know seeing the, the clock end in the north bank and, and being there was surreal and um you know, it's always to me it's a it's an old term maybe because we're, we're reminiscent it's a proper football club you know yeah. your likes of mm. united are and, and you know you look at the likes of arsenal liverpool coming to that bracket you know it's got great tradition great history and when you play for a club like that it, it, it means a lot you you've, you've achieved something special because there's not too many people can play for that and i was lucky enough to to play against them and, and, and a score against them and things like that. I was going to ask and, uh, you that, actually. Yeah, no, no. How was it playing against Arsenal at Highbury? What was it like? Oh, it was wow. fantastic. I mean, it was, you know, playing against these players and you know, from Kevin's time and then when the likes of Omri and, uh, and Burkamp was there. I mean, it was, it was magnificent. And, you know, you want to play against the best. And if they was wearing that red shirt and playing for the Arsenal, you knew they was, they was good players. So it's always special. And, Kevin be the same. You want to play against good players all the time. And we knew where we come from and how hard we worked to get there. And, uh, but sometimes you used to look across and you'd have Big Tony at the front and David Seaman. And then you'd have Martin Keown, who's only a mother would love his face. So he, he's, <laughs> he's standing there, snar- snarling at you. And then you've got Patrick, Mal Petit, and then you think, OK, all right, can't get any harder. And then Dennis and Henri would walk out at the back of them. You think, well, we better be up for this game and <laughs> make sure. And, uh, you know, at the time at Newcastle, we'd have you know, some good players and obviously at Wimbledon. But uh, special times because, uh, as I said, you know, we had one of the most innovative coaches ever with Arsene Wenger. Uh, and before that with George Graham, who I had a lot of time with as well. Um, and a great football club. So, yeah, I was very proud of support. And as you get older as well, you drift away. I mean, obviously, I'm a big fan of Newcastle tonight. I want them to do well because of the fans and, and the club and you know, living in that area for eight years. Uh, a big, big hub. But I always look at Arsenal and say that my oldest son Milo is a big Arsenal fan as well as my brother Johnny. Yeah, I remember you know Johnny. what, you know, you know what, Warren. Um, you know, I love hearing your. I love hearing players talk authentically about the teams they loved growing up, despite the teams that they go on to play for. Because I think as a professional, you can completely separate the two. And you really did have a wonderful career at Newcastle United, and. Um, when you look at like your love for Arsenal and all the rhetoric that's gone, gone on in the last maybe three or four seasons about this grand power shift and we're living in a time where everyone was saying this is Tottenham's greatest ever season in the Premier League. They're going into this $1 billion stadium and you think to yourself, wow, they could actually be playing Europa League football on Thursday nights now. What do you think about that so-called power shift, especially as Spurs haven't really won a trophy, Arsenal won three FA Cups even in their darkest days? What's your take on that rhetoric and that narrative? I think a little bit I look at it, and uh, I do admire what Pochettino's doing, and I know this is obviously an Arsenal coach, and you have to be, there's a lot of Arsenal fans, and, what, and I understand as well, whatever Spurs do is going to be rubbish. <laughs> that, that comes from my brother as well, so, you know, whatever they're doing. <laughs> but you, you do... In today's market where you can spend so much money and just buy success to an extent, I'm not saying that we're totally going to win every trophy, but you can buy your way up 
into the Champions League. I do admire what he's doing, you know, going into lower leagues and getting someone like Adele Alley and giving him a chance to play. That's how me and Kev got to where we go and play for your country and go and play in Champions League and compete and win trophies. Is you, you got the chance to play and the likes of Harry Kane. It is a new stadium, you know, it, but it is still in Tottenham, so it doesn't matter where it's going to be. It's, it's not. It's not going to be like in Islington, which is a wonderful area or anything like that. So, uh, but they built this wonderful stadium. Um, I do admire what he's doing, but. It goes back to the old cliche, and we had the same problem in Newcastle. Until you win something, no one's going to take you into that level. And a good friend of Brad Friedel, he was on the show, and I've worked with both for a number of years, and we had a big debate when they had a chance of maybe winning an FA Cup or winning a trophy, and they never did. Then they're playing catch-up. Until he does that, you're going to keep mm-hmm. asking the question. Klopp's going to have the same question. So, you know, half of me admires what he's doing. He's getting young players. He's got players for the academy coming through. Harry Winch and all these opportunities that he's given and they're battling their way out there but they might just come short because City and Liverpool and United are, are spending that money and that's where Arsenal need to do that they've had so many years of success with what Arsenal was doing getting these young players from whether it was from France or Spain Fabregas them type of players that no one had really heard too much about and come on and making these global stars um that, that dried up because everyone was doing that. Now you have to compete with what's out there. You look at PSG and Juventus. You know They're spending money on, on Ronaldo, 100 million, to try and win the Champions League. So it, it, it's very difficult to sustain that. And what Arsenal have got to be careful with, and the likes of if like Newcastle, that's just going to end up being a, a third Premier League team, relig- you know, third-tier Premier League team, which is fighting relegation all the time. That's what you're going to be up against unless you break that gap and either develop young players and then obviously go and bend some money on some, some big superstars. I mean, Kev, I don't know whether you agree, but I'd rather go and get one top one like we did with Alan Shearer and spend fifteen million rather than spend five million on three strikers that might get you seven goals each, where this fella's going to get you twenty five. Yeah, Warren, let me just uh, ask you this because you, you make a good point. Pochettino has done a good job. But and then he comes out in the press and says it's not about trophies. And that bit I don't get. Because but, if you're trying to build something, it's all about trophies, isn't it? Yes, no, absolutely. I think a little bit, and we've seen him lose his call, you know, when he went on the field and had the argument with the referee. Burnley. He's never been like that. And, yeah, and I think the pressure's got to him. And I, that's, you know, the Premier League does that. You know, you've got journalists in your face every day. You've got one paper saying you're great. You've got another paper saying you can't coach anywhere. So he has to deal with it. And that's what pressure's done to him. And with the expectations, like you said, you know, a billion-dollar stadium, being in the Champions League, one, arguably one of the best strikers in the world with Harry Kane, and there is another gifted midfield player, that's pressure. So I think he's having to come out with comments like that to try and protect himself and maybe protect his players, because otherwise the fans will be unhappy of the fact that, OK, we're just happy to finish. And say they do finish fifth, and like you said, playing in Europa, that's going to be a failure, because they can't end up you know, one thing with Wenger, what he did, they always in the Champions League going into the new stadium, making sure that they're c- competing. So you're, you're right, uh, Kev, I think. But I think he did a lot of that with the pressure, but also just trying to protect his players and himself because they were on an awful run. They got one point out of five, five games, which is... I looked at Spurs, I thought, they're never going to go on a bad run. I thought they might lose a game, but then but I, c- I couldn't see them not winning that away from home in four games, five Warren, games. Warren, because you, Warren, Warren. What? what? Warren, <laughs> they, ju- they just spursy up. It's every season, it spursy. That's the end Clock of it. Work. But, but, it. But with that said, with that spursy, spursy comment, I, I want to I wanna ask Warren, because he's been in a dressing room where things like that have happened. Warren, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were in the 95, 96, 96, 97 Newcastle team, right? With yep. Keegan, Ginola, Ferdy, um, Shearer. I mean, you guys probably, if I'm going to put some um, with flash teams in terms of playing beautiful football and I'm creating a top five of the Premier League over the last 20 plus years, Arsenal are in there, the Invincibles team, of course, the United treble team are in there, Manchester City's team from last year. And I would argue that Kevin Keegan and, and Kev, you can chime in here and Amanda, I would argue that Keegan's team in that two year span played some stunning football and you were part of the manager so Pochettino's had those collapses a couple times saying weird things in press conferences you had Kevin Keegan doing the I would love it I would love it if we beat them as a player when that moment is happening when you realize are the wheels coming off 
what happens in the dressing room? What's going on? What are the conversations between the players, the manager? Uh, I'm trying to get into that Tottenham locker room right now thinking, are the wheels coming off? Are they done? Yeah, it's uh, it's all about getting momentum. And when we had that with Kevin Keegan at the beginning, you know, to go and sign Les Ferdinand come in as a record signer, Andy Cole had left and then Les come in. Ginola walked through the door and he takes your breath away just looking at him, let alone when he played. So he was a, a top code player. And I noticed that he put Ginola in there as well. He didn't say anyone about anybody else. It's all about Ginola. But anyway, you had him and, you know, we had momentum at the beginning, you know, winning the games, getting going. And then Sir Alex, being Sir Alex, started mind games. And that's what I'm saying with the pressure. Even then, back in, in them times, he would say certain things, oh, you're playing to appear to the testimony. I bet you're going to throw that game because you've got them at the end of the season. And that's when Kevin lost it. And, we just turned around. I remember with me, Les and Peter was having a, a cup of tea after training and I just said that we, we never at that time and, you know, Kevin said with George Graham, we never, with Keegan, we never really planned ahead to think, what do we need to do? We've got Man United coming up on a Monday night. This was a big mm. game, you know, if we, yeah, we went up there and, sorry, we was at home. We absolutely battered them in the first half. It, it could have been 5-0. We ended up being 5-0 the following year, but Schmeichel was playing out of this world. So we always, knew, they knew they'd just do their job. They'd done that. We was like, oh, okay, right now we need to win, and it just got, it got, and it's just like having sand in your hand, and you couldn't grab it. It kept on slipping out. The harder we tried, the worse it got, um, and unfortunately, it's haunted us for the rest of our lives. Because it, it wouldn't have been for us, and I think Kevin can relate winning, winning the title. It's not for us; it's for the fans to have that. It's great to have that memory to say, yeah, I've been a winner and I've had it, and I can only imagine because I've come second twice, as you reminded me. But to actually win it would be for the fans in the area because it means so much for them people up there. Hundred percent, hundred percent, Warren. I, I think. Well, I, I love, I love Newcastle. I love the, I love that era. Uh, I thought your team was su- superb. Uh, what, what I, what I want to know, Warren, is what, what was it like actually playing for Kevin Keegan? Because he had such sorry. a youthful. Hi, exuberant... sorry. Oh, hello. Hi, Amanda. I just asked Warren what was it like playing for Kevin Keegan because in that time. You used to go home and away and just attack. That was a team talk. <laughs> that, was, that was it, Kit. I mean, listen, we, we played Wimbledon at home, my old club, and uh, we was at St. James's Park, and, and you're talking about what Kevin Keegan's team talks was like. You know, remember, Kevin, the, the, the captain would go in with the manager, with the referees. I don't know whether it's changed a little bit now, but the captain yes, would go in with the referees. Yes, still do, I think, yeah. Get, get, get the team sheet and come in to us so we know what the, the line-up is. So... He's put up there our lineup, who we're playing, uh, and obviously Wimbledon. He looked at the team sheet, and it might have been because it was Wimbledon or whatever, but he rolled it up and threw it on the floor. He went, don't worry about that. He said, just go and play. We ended up winning 6-1. Six, six really, when he got in the end. <laughs> yes, we ended up winning 6-1. But he didn't, he had that, it was whether that Liverpool or how he was, he, he respected teams in a sense, but he said, if we play at our best, a bit like Pep, we'll really, be, we'll we play at the best, but we'll beat anybody. And... 95% of the time we was right, but it's just, you know, when people's maybe a little bit of confidence when he brought Asprey in, then instead of having, and you can relate to this with Les and Peter Beersley was on the same way. Look, you're as right, he was the same. You'd flick it on, yeah. he'd run to it. He'd, he'd flick it on, you'd be running on. You just knew each other inside out. And they had that same understanding, Les and Peter. Tina yeah. come in, it was a great, great player. I'm talking about a top half at home. Not, not right away from home. You didn't know, yeah. see him at Highbury, but at home. And it just, it, then we put Peter a little bit on the right. Keith then got left out. Ginola was there. And it just left a little bit of the balance. And again, like I would go back to, I said that momentum. But playing for Kevin was brilliant because when it was good, and it was good 95% of the time, he was fantastic. You know, the, the way he used to make you feel, the way he would talk to you, um, how good you was as a player. And whether it was just a, a, a way of man management his skills but when it went wrong and it happened with England Kevin you were like he sort of went the other way then he went oh no I'm walking away I don't want to be like that I've probably, as I said come from you know being told twice I was too small I'm going to stick with it and fight through it yeah. I wanted him to do that I didn't want him to walk away and say oh I ain't got the money I'm going to we're never going to win it I'm going to say well I'm going to show you what I've got and try and do it but he was magnificent it was fantastic to to be around, um, and as I said, a great, great training. We used to have fun. It was all light-hearted. Tactics, systems, things like that, no. It was just about, right, you're a good player. Philip Albert, you're a good player. Rob Lee, you're a good player. Just get it to you know if you're struggling. And if not, just put it on Leslie's head and he'll score. And that's really how it was. <laughs> yeah. I remember that, Philip Albert. Do you guys remember that, Philip Albert? Yeah. Wonder goal against the United trip. in the rain. Yeah. 
Oh my God. Wow. That was amazing. You know, Warren, do you think it's even possible to coach that way these days with everything in the modern game, the, the, Ke- the Keegan way? Is that even possible? Yeah, I, th- I still think, you know, the, the game has, in- has changed and, you know, there's a lot more understanding of tactics and system. But it is about players. It is about man, man management. I'm talking about higher up as well. I mean, you've only got to look sometimes at, you know, look at Shul- Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. He's gone to Manchester United. Arguably, Mourinho is one of the biggest tacticians of the last decade. But it was all too much for them, you know, because of his man management skill and how he hadn't evolved as a coach. Um that the players wasn't responding. And maybe towards the end, Arsene Wenger was the same. You know, he hadn't evolved as, uh, as much as he maybe would have done. And I think you can get away with that. You know, if you make good players feel great, they're going to be, you know, confidence is such a big thing. And if you make average players, good players, and then good players, you know, exceptional players, and then you can get one or two world-class players that United have got, and, you know, probably Man City and other teams, you, you can have that in effect. So I think you can do that, but I do think there's, a lot more into the game about different systems now where, where before me and Kev it was really 4-4-2 or 4-3-3 and that was really what it was I remember when Aston Villa started playing three at the back and it was like well how do you, you deal with that when John mm. Gregory done it with Gareth Southgate now yeah. Kev me, me and you would know how to play against it you go and get your number nine going stand on Gareth and get your two wide players to stay and so the game's evolved as we have as, as players but at the time it was very much you know 4 4 2 it was going to be a battle, and whoever the best players was, nine times out of ten, was going to win the game. But the game's game. changed and evolved. But there's, there's still the fundamentals of teaching players, getting the best out of players, man management players, will always be the same because the, the, the game will never change. Do you think Thierry Henry was the best ever we've seen in the Premier League in terms of an attacking player? Apart from Kevin Campbell? Um, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, that was I, at the I, youth team warrant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would have, I would have said he he was phenomenal. Uh, that period that he had, the late nineties, early two thousand, he was unstoppable. And I'm, I was lucky enough to play against him when he was at Monaco in uh, European football in Europa. Uh, and I've never seen anyone as quick as him when he just before he went off to Juventus. Then when he went to Arsenal, and I always really got on with Terry Henry. He, when we play against each other, because we, we swapped shirts when we was at Monaco. Uh, sorry, sorry when, yeah, when he was at Monaco and I was at Newcastle. So, you know, we, we've always had that affinity. You know what it's like, Kevin, swap a shirt, shake hands, you always have one or two words. And, and yeah. he goes on and has a career. But he was arguably the best foreign player, probably the best player ever. in Because he could do it all. He was quick. He had great ability. He could score headers, volleys. Ronaldo at the time wasn't in the bracket of what Omri was if, you know, Ronaldo and uh, Messi, they're, in, they're from a different planet, but yeah. Terry was him, but he, he did have Dennis next to him and Dennis sometimes goes on, and I don't know how, but sometimes a little bit underestimated because he was, he just made everything tick for Arsenal. I know Patrick and, and Albert T and Tony Adams get, but I think if you ask any of that group of players, Dennis was was the one that made him tick because he had that side to him. He could he could do it all. But Henri was for me was the best player I've ever played in the Premier League because I think he epitomises that time as well. Good looking, he had the transition Matthew. time, right? The chance, he was yeah, part of that yeah. Transition he, he could, time, yeah. Yeah, people could relate to him. They wanted to be near him. He was a celebrity. He, could, he had a certain walk of struts and he had it all. Um, Obviously, he can't coach. Warren, were you playing in that? <laughs> were you were you playing? Were you playing in the game where Dennis scored that wonder goal against you guys? Probably one of the greatest we've seen. The yeah, the, uh, the listen, chip uh, uh, Were you? In... We well, went yeah, round yeah. the visas. <laughs> yeah, 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 that one. Yeah, yeah. Nikos went. To, this is a funny story. Nikos went to me. He went. He didn't mean it, did he? I went, my Greek boy. Joking? My Greek boy. By the way, oh, I yeah, love my Greek boys. boy. <laughs> Nikos, <laughs> we could. We called him Beckenbauer and he thought it was a compliment. We called him the Kaiser and he thought it was a compliment. <laughs> it was like, no, we're not, it's not a compliment. Um, and he, um, he, when Dennis done that, yeah, I mean, he's the only one. This is a quick story, I tell you. He's the only one that's not make me, uh, Dennis. It was, a, it was at Highbury. <laughs> it was a corner. Big David Siemens punched it in the air and it's gone, I don't know, about 40 foot in the air. Now I'm running towards Pat Rice and um, Arsene Wenger, where them little dugouts was right on there. So it's been in the air now for about five, ten seconds, the ball. Dennis has gone out there. The outside of his left foot span it through my legs. Now I'm looking at Pat Rice and Arsene Wenger, and I went, he's in good, isn't he? It went straight through my legs, and he went round the other side to get it. So if I'm going to get nutmegged, I'm going to have it by Dennis Burkamp, because he, uh, he was a top-class player. But, yeah, he's the only one that nutmegged me on purpose. <laughs> 
Did Kevin, well, Kevin, get did Kevin by someone? Did, it's good to be nutmeg yeah, by did, him. Yeah, yeah exactly. if you're gonna get hey, nutmeg. Listen. I'm going to go, it could have been to Dan, it could have been Giggs, but it wasn't, it was him. So anyway. <laughs> oh, I'm sick of hearing about Giggs. Warren, we're going to see this uh, shirt pulling off and this FA Cup semi-final goal for 100, 100 million times before the season ends with this 20-year anniversary of uh, United's treble and stuff like that. But we know you're on your way to training, so um, we want to get you out on a few questions. Um, so here we go with our little quick fire round. Real quick... Um, do you see Arsenal finishing in the top four? Do they finish above Spurs? Top four and yes. Yes and yes. They've got momentum. All right. Do you think no. Spurs end up finishing fifth? No. I think you they will think get in the United, top four. You think United will end up fifth? Yeah, I think they might slip up United. I, I don't know whether they are, their, their wheels might come off. We, ne we never know. But yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with them sneaking in. All right, so I've, I've pitched this thing to Kevin and Amanda, and I want you to know if you think I'm crazy. 20 years on, United win the treble. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wears the number 20 shirt. He's now manager of the team that he helped win that miracle Champions League game against Bayern Munich. Any chance, 20 years on, the miracle happens for United? Can they beat Barcelona and go on to win the Champions League? I think they can beat Barcelona. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult because they've got a certain player called Messi. Uh, it's funny how fate is sometimes. Uh, and someone's said to, already he's been lucky uh, as a coach to do that. I'd rather be lucky than good, to be honest with you. But I don't think they're good enough as a team to go and win it. Uh, as much as his team that he had, maybe they didn't have the night, but they were some really good leaders and personalities. Uh, I still think they're vulnerable at the back. I still think you can, you can, you can take chances against them. So... Against the top teams, that's why I think they may slip up a little bit. Mm. It'd be a lovely Warren, story, but I don't see it. Warren, mm. who do you reckon is going to win it? Liverpool or I think City? City. I, I think Liverpool will win the league. I think City will win the Champions League. Oh, you think Liverpool will win the league? Yeah, I've gone with Liverpool. You know, you just get a sneak. That result the weekend, they get a little bit of luck. That's what you need, a little bit of lady luck. Uh, yeah, I think City was bought, Pep was bought there to win them the... The Champions League has already won the league, so uh, I, th I think they win the FA Cup. They won the obviously the League Cup, and I think they go and win the Champions League. Um, I think you've just upset yeah, been... Kevin by saying Liverpool are going to win the league, hasn't he, Kev? Big time. Are you at yeah. training Kevin yet? Does, hey, Kevin, you... <laughs> he never gets, I've never. He just puts out that lovely big smile of his, and everything, the world's a lot better. So that matters, doesn't it? <laughs> he gives you that good look at that Hollywood smile, and the world's a better. Red place, nose, Donald, like, like it. Oh. That, that bow tie. <laughs> That bow tie. Okay, so Warren, do we make? How about an all England final in the Champions League and the Europa League? What do you think about them apples? That would be lovely. Yeah, I mean, being over here, obviously in the states, you, you want your, mm -hmm. your Premier League teams to do well. So I think, yeah, it'd be fantastic. You know, Arsenal win the Europa; they've got a tough game, but yeah, that that's possible. Um, and yeah, maybe a Manchester uh, Champions League final. That'd be interesting as well. So yeah, I, I think that could happen. You know, Warren, I moved here in 2000. I moved here in 2001, a couple months before 9/11. And when I first moved here, I could barely find a game on on uh, football. It was the old Fox Channel. There was one game on on a Saturday, and um, I was literally getting my cousins to just hold the phone over uh, for me so I could listen to all the games and to kind of see. The journey of not only Fox Soccer and the fact that you were a, a very much involved in the pioneering broadcasting team from the very beginning with Fox to see what NBC have done over the last few years. And, and the uh, I'm sure you watched all of the stuff in Boston this weekend. The beautiful game really has grown here in the United States. MLS is growing for sure, but the European game has done so much to add the richness to how the great game has grown here. And now you're coaching as well. And um, I'm sure I'm going to come to a game one day here where you're coaching an MLS team. Before you go, talk, to, talk us through a little bit about the United States, being an expat, living here, having had such an illustrious career in the UK. You've been one of those players that a lot of people know about. Tell us a little bit about what you think about the game here, how it's grown, and through your eyes, what the journey has been. Yeah, I mean, it's, 
it's a constant battle because you're up against uh, a monster of the, the NFL and also the college sports as well. I mean, you just mentioned March Madness, which is college basketball. So people in the UK can't really get to comprehend how can you get so excited about college basketball and, uh, and what's been going, as well as not only the, the Premier League games, but the women's game over here is, is huge as well with the national team. We've got the World Cup coming up in, in France, obviously. You've seen England come out here with, with Phil Neville and, and win the trophy. So particularly in the last, you know, as I said, I've moved here 11 years ago and it was really just a, a small cable company of, of getting the, the games showing. And what really surprised me is that you could actually see the three o'clock game. So not only did you have the early kickoff, you have the three o'clock game, which, which was live, and then the evening game. So, you know, being here in the US, you can actually sit there for, you know, six, seven hours and watch it television. Then, obviously, the Liga got interested in another channel, uh, Bundesliga now, and just the game has exploded in the sense with what Beckham started when he first came over. But then the quality of coaches, the, the different franchises now that are in places like Cincinnati, which is really in the Midwest, and they're getting 36, 37,000 people coming to watch them in, in an MLS game. And the grassroots level with the kids, boys and girls is getting bigger and bigger. It's the biggest growing sport. But you're always up against the NFL uh, in, in the signs of TV and college. But like you've just said there, with the, the TV company and NBC done a, a fantastic job of going into Fenway Park, which is in Boston, a, a very, very famous baseball stadium. Uh, and having a, a full weekend of, of soccer being shown there, different celebrities and ex-players being in there, and um, you know, really go around the game, the interest. Uh, and it's not a novelty. Well, I think 10 years ago, it was like, oh, who is this Arsenal? Who is this Chelsea? They actually know now. You know, the internet, they want to know about players. They know, they really inform the fans. And it's not just now people are just trying to understand the game. They, they get the game. They know the game. Uh, and now they're ready for that next step of, you know, different coaches, different players in the game is being took on a, a more serious level where before you have the NFL, as I said, and, you know, probably the NBA is up there uh, as well with people like LeBron James, which is a mega superstar, obviously. But now soccer's competing with hockey, baseball. You know, baseball's a little bit like the older person sport. So now soccer's got a bit trendy, younger people, very much Kevin and related, like mid-90s, 2000s, when... You know, people in the cities was getting involved in football. People in the country, what's this game? And they start supporting. So it wasn't just predominantly a male sport. You're getting all different types of walk of life coming to the games, which is fantastic. You know, kids come in to watch their games and not feeling that there's going to be any trouble. And it opens up a whole floodgate of a different audience and different people. And I think that's what's happening over here, where it's young, it's vibrant, it's new. And it's going to get bigger and bigger because they've got the appetite, they've got the bug. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully it continues because it's exciting and it makes my job a lot easier. Um, and, and obviously I've been very, very lucky doing that. You're right, I had a good career back in the UK and 18 years of playing. And then in 2008, I decided to move my family out here and I want to look back. It's a great country. It's very positive in what they're doing. And that shows in the, the fan base and the atmosphere of the grounds and you know, as I said, the, the knowledge is there as well. They understand the game, which is which is great, and um, and it's going to get bigger, bigger, and better as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So brilliant. I was I was at the LA Galaxy last night and saw Zlatan pull off a Penenka and his enthusiasm. He's like a child. He's, it's amazing just seeing his, you know, love for the game. And I think with you and Kev, what's amazing is that at the end of the day, you're footballers and you love playing football and you love the game. And I think sometimes in the midst of the mayhem and the madness and the merchandise and everything that goes with it, um, you guys just love playing football. And every time I go into that dressing room at the end of the game at the LA Galaxy and I see Zlatan, he just loves playing football. And that's what it is. Mm. I, I like it's just that, it? When I started, Kevin, it, it wasn't, well, I'm going to try as much as it. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about that. It, and, you know, it was about playing and, and doing and well and playing for the country. It? And making it. And making it. And I think that it's still part of the game. That's still part of why we get in love with it. That's why we follow it. And why we're excited with England, you know, talking about the young players now that are coming through with England, they seem to have that hunger. So hopefully that's part of it because it's arguably the best game in the world. You know, there's not, there's not too many other sports that that gets you where you're going. And I think both of us, Kevin and myself, knew we was lucky, you know, and we appreciate yeah. it. And that's why we enjoy it so much. Big time. Big time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start it. crying. Love it. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. My goal was to make you cry. I've been trying to make Kev cry all season. 
Um, I mean, I made Amanda cry a few times. Amanda, are you crying over there because your computer's crashed as well? You're right. You I know, and I'm so you, sorry, you, Warren. I have, I have to go, but it's just been amazing <laughs> talking to you after all these years. And uh, keep doing what you're doing, and thanks for coming on. But guys, I have to go. You two carry on. Take, take all right, care. You, G, take, take care. Man. See you, Amanda. Take I care. will. Bye, Bye all. Bye, Warren. Bye, Bye darling. Yeah, Bye, we're darling. hoping she's definitely got the first half of the show. Uh, if not, we're going to have to call Warren back. But no, uh, Warren, I know you've got to go to training, and yeah. you don't want to be late for training because you're setting an example for your players, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, I've got to be there, set up, organised. Ex exactly. So, Kev, we have to leave him with asking him this question. Emery, first season. No matter what happens at this point, Arsenal have done pretty okay, right, Warren? I think he's done well. It reminds me very much of what Arsenal was at the beginning. You know, he's kept to his ideas, he's kept to his principles. He's had to deal with Ozil, which is, wasn't going to be easy. Um, and they still kept that fermenter of being a good, entertaining football club. So I like him. I, I see a lot of him in Europa with Seville. Uh, and hopefully he continues because he wants to play the game the right way. So, uh, and he seems a, a good man. And I think the more people like that are in the game, the better. So Arsenal's future is in good hands, Warren. I do, Kev. I, I really do. I think uh, I think you've got a good manager. I think he's a sensible manager. He knows the game. He knows his players. Uh, yeah, I, I do like him, and I think it's been a, a tough time because it's never going to be easy following, you know, arguably awesome. the best mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Arsenal thing. Yeah. yeah. Regardless of what people felt for him at the end, which was an absolute disgrace, but you know, the time was right for him to go. He should have gone 18 months beforehand, but he he gone and. I think he's in good hands. I like him. I don't know whether you feel the same, Kim, but uh, I, I, I do, do like I, him as a person. I agree with you, mate. I do. Mm. I tell you what, Wenger might be a top shelf coach, but you've been a top shelf guest, Mr. Warren Barton. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And maybe if I can pitch this to you, will you come back in the summer? I'd love to moderate a one on one with you and Kev on a little old school football, uh, married yeah, with yeah, a new yeah. school um, kind of uh, mental um, look at the game and stuff like that. If you're willing to come back, we'd love to have you. All right, no problem. You only said summer. You'll have to let me know because here it's always 75 degrees. So I don't know when the summer is. It's like, it's like that was for Kevin's here, benefit. So. Uh, uh, listen, Kevin. as it rains over here. Cheers. Thanks a lot. I'm just going to go put my flip-flops on. Hey, yeah, Warren, you have a great one, mate. And thanks for coming on. And thanks for looking Top after man, me. Kev. I was out there. Hey, anything for you. You know that. Anything. Anything. Nice Good one, gentleman. mate. You take, take care. care. Bye, guys. Thanks, thanks so Warren. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. All right, so our girl Amanda had to go. Warren's off to training. Brilliant interview, top shelf stuff. You guys have a tremendous amount of respect for each other, Kev. That was really lovely. That was a lovely combo. Yeah, uh, Warren Barton is a top, top guy. As I say, we've n known each other for such a long time. And he's, he's made such a fantastic life for himself in America. But you could see he's still got that passion for uh, the English, fo English game and English football, yeah. which is uh, great to see. Definitely. He hasn't lost that. Okay. So Warren was a, a Newcastle legend. He played for Newcastle. We played Newcastle tonight. We haven't really got into the X's and O's of the game. It wasn't the prettiest of games, not our best that we've had. But in years past, maybe this is one that, you know, we would have drawn or lost, Kev. A very professional performance at the end of the day, would you say that was fair? Yeah, I'd say so. I, I, I'd say the result was a lot more important than the performance. Mm. There was times where we played some good flow in football and, and we, we just couldn't really, didn't really have a cutting edge. I think Ramsey's foot, the goal that got disallowed for Socrates pulling, I think it's Lejean at the back, that should have stood. Um, I thought the referee was a bit picky um, and, and didn't really give us much. But it was great to see Ramsey get his goal, which you tweeted. Um, <laughs> yes, you did tweet that. Um <laughs> And and to see Lacazette get on the score sheet as well, I think is really important. Obviously, Aubameyang wasn't too well, um, so he, he couldn't start. But I think Lacazette, at, he, he works so hard and he's a constant threat. And it's always nice to see him get on the score sheet because I think he's a real confidence player. And if his confidence is high, he, he will perform. You know what, and, Kev, uh, as much yeah. as we've, as much as uh, Lack has been, you know, given a lot of round of applause this season, do you feel like we're underappreciating him a little bit in terms of what he does off 
the ball. A lot of the times with a striker, we just focus so much on their um, offensive play, their goals or their assists. But a lot of the times, a great striker, you don't really identify what they do off the ball. Do you feel that is the case with Laka a little bit? Uh, I think as the seasons wore on, a lot of Arsenal fans have realised that Lacquer is the one who actually makes the team tick. Mm-hmm. Earlier on in the season, it was it was more, you know, get your goals, get your goals, get your goals. But as the season's gone on, and there's been some 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 toughish times, Lacazette's always been the one who's, who stood out. He's been that focal point, and fans see that. And he, he has played a massive part in Arsenal getting to third place that where we are now. And he's got a massive part to play for the last six games. Because if he's playing well, Arsenal stand a real good chance of winning these games. And as a former striker, Kev, can you also appreciate the fact that really for Laka, especially earlier on in the season, he was getting subbed, wasn't he? At yeah. 70 minutes, 65 minutes, even at halftime in some cases. And even when he was facing that adversity, what would he do when he was going off? He'd clap, he'd, get, he'd try and get the fans behind the team and stuff like that. He's shown so much maturity and true leadership in a team that's really needed it this season, hasn't he? He certainly has. And I think he's become the talisman uh, mm-hmm. for for the team. You know, when he scores, everybody wants to go and celebrate with him. And I just think he's got that, he's got that quiet confidence about him that he knows, you know, he's a good player and he, he's going to perform. And when he does perform, Arsenal are, are a better team for him being in it. So, um, it's great that he's got he's showing that leadership and hopefully that leadership will, will keep us in third place. Yeah, I agree. And another milestone, correct me if I'm wrong, Kev, and maybe the Guna Nation will, but I believe this is Leno's first uh, consecutive games in with sheet. a clean sheet, which yep, is really right. a milestone for him. And let's applaud him because... I feel like we haven't really had that stability in the back of the net. Czech has been great for us, of course, over the last few seasons. But it feels like that back four is more cohesive now because they trust who's in goal and he also trusts his back line. It's a bit of a milestone for Leno, don't you think? Yeah, I think having back-to-back um, clean sheets is important for a goalkeeper, especially Leno. It's his first season. He doesn't know really what to expect about the at the Premier League and I think he's starting to show how, how good a goalkeeper he is. He didn't really have much to do tonight but what he what he did have to do he done well mm-hmm. and I think that's really important for him moving forward. He's got a big part to play in, in, in the last six games as well because there's going to be times when we're under the cosh and we're going to need him. So, yeah, and we had no got, Torreira, no Torreira today, no Xhaka, no, no, pro, yeah. no, no kind of, none of that dominant protection that we've seen um, over the last, you know, a few months in front of that back line, Kev. And I think, you know, credit to the midfield and credit to the team for kind of stepping up when some key players, including Bellerin, who we've missed, obviously, for a good few weeks now, uh, the team stepped up. Uh, yes, and I've got to pay a, a big respect to uh, Socrates. Yes, so bravo, he, bravo, bravo, bravo. He... he <laughs> makes that because it was a back three tonight yes he made he dealt with Rondon very well that physicality he's got he dealt with him very well and Arsenal are a better team with Socrates in it 100% uh, Arsenal are a better team with Socrates in it he's Mustafi the man still, now Mustafi still at times gives me a heart attack <laughs> at the back sometimes you know and he, he does some things really well Mustafi and then he'll he'll, he'll play a pass straight to a Newcastle player. You know, it's it's crazy. I, I wish I could take Mustafi's positional prowess and marry it with someone else's feet and mind. I mean, he's at times he's that German defender where his positioning and everything about him is so intelligent. And then there's these times where he almost loses his mind. And I don't even know where that comes from. But you're right. Socrates at the beginning... I think there were some people that were a little dubious about the signing. They weren't sure if he was past his sell-by day. But boy, is he fit well into an Arsenal shirt. And I think he's given us a little bit of that dirty grit at the back that we haven't had in a good few seasons, Kev. Totally agree. 
He's, he's gritty, he's determined, he's tough. And we've missed that. But, you know, he's on nine yellow cards. I, I don't think he got booked tonight. I don't and, think he did. <laughs> and if he, gets booked, if he gets booked, he misses two games because that'll be his 10th. So that's he's something be careful. we're going to... He's, he's going to get booked. I mean, come on. He's, he's a no-nonsense defender, so he will get booked at some stage. But we are better with him in the team. We are. Now, look, Kev, uh, overall, not a great performance. Solid. Uh, you know, Newcastle, to give them credit, they did really well with their tactics, didn't they? And, and round of applause to Rafa. I mean, they had us nervy until, what, the 82nd minute? And, yeah. you know, they did their jobs. But I'm going to let you have the last word here. A monumental weekend for the Guna Nation. No one gave us a chance at the beginning of the season. Everyone said that we were going to be the sixth or seventh team. And here we are in a time where we're rebuilding. We were broken. We had a lot of challenges. Our fame, fan base was divided. And as a Guna that most Gunas love and adore, I think you would say two points ahead of Spurs with seven games to play. Granted, we've got a few tough away games. Regardless of how this shakes out, this hasn't been hasn't been such a bad first season for Unai Emery, has it? It definitely hasn't. And if, I've, if I'm not mistaken, we've equaled our points tally of last season already. We now. have, yes, correct. Yeah. So that just goes to show what a job Unai Emery's done. We've got six games to go. Yeah, we have got some tough, tough games. Of course, we have. But you know what? A fantastic opportunity for for Arsenal to get back in that Champions League. I think, I think that's so important to have for it to happen mm -hmm. in the league. Great if we could do something in the Europa, but to do it in the league as well, to, to finish in that third spot and to qualify for the Champions League, I think is massive for the football club, especially in like Emery's first first season. Yeah, I agree. And in a time where we really need to rely on maybe some loan deals because we don't have the gazillion dollars that we need to spend, we've got to balance the book somehow. If we can guarantee Champions League football, that makes our bartering a little bit more stronger, doesn't it, Kev? Yes, it does. It does. And we know there's going to be some chopping and changing in the summer. Unai Emery, he's, he'll have a year under his belt and he'll know exactly what is required. So, you know, there's going to be some... It's going to be a an interesting summer, but let's 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 take what he's done so far, you know, to our hearts, and hopefully we could finish the job off. Uh, I, I really wish we can because I think he deserves it. Definitely, and we're proud of our team tonight, and um, we're also uh, very happy to have had Warren Barton on as a guest. Thank you, Warren. Uh, thank you, PG. Thank you, Super Kev. As usual, brilliant show. Um, some really good dialogue. And, you know, uh, Arsenal will be coming to the United States in the summer. I'm beyond psyched. We're going to have a little bit more information on that in our upcoming pods. Uh, and we'll have some of the kids from Arsenal America on. Uh, really exciting times for the Guna fan base here in the United States where I am. Our next game is against the Toffees. Super yep. Your love is going to be almost... I think like 60 40, because I know where the 60 lies. <laughs> <laughs> listen, <But> no. <laughs> listen, let me just get this straight. Remember, uh, remember I'm buying drinks. I am, Ars I am an Arsenal fan, but when I was at Everton, I fell in love with Everton. Everton is a lovely club. So I don't ever want any harm to, to happen to Everton, obviously, but I am an Arsenal fan. So. That's, you know what, it. Super Kev? You know what? If we are going to draw any away game this coming end of the season, I'll be more than happy for it to be at Goodison Park. How about that? As long as we win against Watford and Wolves and Leicester, I'm more than happy to share the spoils with the Toffees. They are my secret favourite team. Nice. Love those guys. And we're going to have the Toffee TV guys on the next show. So that should be a lot of fun. Look good out guys. That. Uh, yeah, yeah, good old uh, Pete and stuff like that. So um, uh, we'll uh, give you some more details on that on Twitter. Look out for us on that Highbury squad. Until then, I'm going to leave it to Kev to do Amanda's job. And say, always Arsenal.